Good morning. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. You know, last week uh, we started the Beatitudes. And actually, you know, we are wrapping up this series on the teachings of Jesus. And uh, we come to Matthew chapter 5. And last week we looked at the first four Beatitudes. Today we're going to look at the second four and start a new series on next Sunday. The Beatitudes, as we looked at last week, are uh, basically characteristics or attributes uh, that ought to be found in a disciple or a true disciple. And so as we look at this this week, um, I want us to, you know, as we look at these Beatitudes, One of the things that I want to just uh, encourage us is we take inventory of how do we measure up to the standards that are listed. How are we doing to, in comparison to what Jesus is uh, listing here uh, in, the, in the Beatitudes. And in many ways, uh, the teachings of Jesus that we've been looking at for the last three, or month, three months or so, how are we doing in, in terms of the s t a n d a r d that Jesus is calling each one of us to live. The fifth beatitude then is Matthew chapter 5. It's found in uh, verse 7. <coughs> Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. To be merciful is to show forgiveness and show compassion and we see God demonstrating this towards us by withholding punishment withholding just punishment meaning this that we deserve to be punished but God in his mercy or he demonstrates his mercy towards us by withholding that punishment Mercy is to show forgiveness and to, compassion to those in need. It was God's compassion is, or His mercy that demonstrated compassion for the sinner, for the broken, for the lost, for you and I. Titus chapter 3 verse 5 says that He saved us not because of righteous, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. And Peter also says in 1 Peter 1.3, In his great mercy, God has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So we see a couple of cases where we see mercy, God demonstrating mercy towards us by withholding the punishment. Withholding punishment. The parable of the Good Samaritan uh, found in Luke chapter 10, verse 33 to 37 Sorry, I didn't get these to you. But in Luke chapter 10, verse 30 through 37, what we see here is the story of the Good Samaritan. And I want to read this uh, parable just quick, real briefly. Jesus shares this story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replies, replied, The one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, Yes, now go and do the same. In this story of the Good Samaritan, we see mercy displayed. We see mercy 
demonstrated in the form of compassion. Dr. John Piper, as he looks at this parable, he identifies four dimensions of mercy that we see in this story. He said, first, mercy sees distress. The difference between the Samaritan and the other two, the priest and the Levite that came, is they saw, but did they really see? They saw, but did they really see the need? Blessed are those. This parable, this story, blessed are those who see a need and respond. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those who see a need and respond. Mercy sees distress. Second, mercy responds with the heart of compassion or pity toward a person in distress. Do you see the combination of these two things in the Samaritan? The priest, a modern-day pastor, I, if I walk by, I see a guy. I just see him, and I ignore him and walk by. Did I really see him? Did I really see the distress? The priest, the Levite, they see, they notice him, but they didn't see him. They didn't see his, dis- see his distress. It responds with the heart of compassion toward a person in distress. third dimension that that he identifies is mercy responds externally with a practical effort to relieve the distress. What we see here is not only did he notice him, he stopped and what did he do? He bandaged his wounds. He bandaged his wounds. Then he picked him up and put him on his own donkey and led him to a place where he could continue to take care of him. Mercy responds externally with a practical effort to relieve the distress. And the fourth dimension of mercy is that it happens even when the person in distress is by religion and race an enemy. We know that this, the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Jews considered the Samaritans to be half-breeds, mixed both culturally and religiously. This half-breed Jew with the warped religious tradition stops to help the Jew who hates him. See, mercy. Mercy is colorblind. Mercy is simply response even to the person who is an enemy. Those are the four dimensions. that he identifies. What does mercy look like in a modern day, in our day? Um, You know, as many of you guys probably do, I was scrolling through Facebook one day, and a picture kind of caught my eye. There was a man dressed in a firefighter outfit or suit, pushing a lawnmower. I mean, Halloween's coming up, so I thought maybe it was somebody, you know, dressed up like a firefighter, you know, out there mowing a lot. I don't know, something weird. But I clicked on it, and I read the story. See, what happened was there was a guy who was mowing his lawn, and he had a medical emergency. And in that moment, p- police and ambulance was called. The first responders came. The man was treated, you know, and he was transported. to the hospital. You know, whenever you call 911, a fire uh, fire truck, ambulance, police, you know, any combination of those will come. So they came, they left. And what, apparently what one of the firefighters decided to do was finish mowing the guy's lawn. Because, you know, he was in the middle of mowing his lawn, he had the medical emergency, and he can't finish it. So he just fired that up, and he just finished mowing the guy's lawn. Somebody took a picture of it, posted it on on social media, and that's when it kind of went viral. You know, his daughter responded to to the post, and she said this. This was my father. That was very kind of you, Eric. He was admitted into the hospital. I know he thanks you as well. You guys go to the limits to help those who 
who need it. Mowing the lawn does not seem like much. But it it just goes to show that a simple act of compassion can go a long ways in making a difference in someone's life. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are those who see a need and respond. Blessed are those who see a need and respond. The sixth beatitude is this, found in verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, the words that are translated pure and heart, the word pure in Matthew 5, 8 means to be clean, blameless, unstained from guilt. The Greek word that when we translate it. And the word for heart is, uh, can be applied to the physical heart, but more often it can also refer to the spiritual center of life. It is where thoughts, desires, sense of purpose, our will, understanding, and character reside. It is the center of our being. A pure heart, what does that mean? So a pure heart means to be blameless in who we are. It means having a singleness of heart towards God. A singleness of heart towards God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. I write it this way. Blessed are those that do not have a heart divided or a divided heart. In James chapter 4, verse 4, it's, we see a picture of what a divided heart looks like. James chapter 4, verse 4, it says this, You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Every time I come to this section in James, it just makes you stop a little bit. What does James say of a person who has a divided heart? A divided heart between the world and God. He calls them adulterers. Purity of heart is a full and total allegiance to God. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who have a total and full allegiance to God. A heart that is not divided between the world and God. A heart that is not divided between love of money and God. A heart that is not divided between your career and God. A heart that is not divided between anything and God. A heart that is set purely on total allegiance to God and only God. That is what the pure heart in heart is. Blessed are those who have the singleness of heart towards God. Seventh beatitude. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Peacemakers. What role do they play? Maybe this will help. Blessed are the bridge builders. Blessed are the bridge builders. I shared with you uh, a while ago that I was reading a book. And um, in it, uh, it talked about this one phrase that really resonated with me. If you want to be a bridge, okay, if, you're a, if you're called to be a bridge builder, get ready to get st- walked on because bridges are made to get walked on. That, that resonates with me so much. And in, in, in this sense, a peacemaker, sometimes you try to make peace between two opposing sides, and they both turn on you, don't they? Blessed are the bridge builders. peacemakers. This word, uh, peacemakers, that that we see here in verse 9, it's not a very common word. Actually, it only happens two times in the entire New Testament. The only other time that we see this word uh, translated as peacemaker is in Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. 
For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. And through him, Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. You see, this word, this idea of peacemaker, it, it shows the work of Christ to reconcile God, us to God, who reconciled us to God. Jesus made peace between God and us, sinners. That is what peacemakers is. If, it's not just, hey, two people are not getting along. Hey, guys, can you guys get along? It's literally bringing these two opposing sides together. Peacemakers. Bridge builders. John Piper says this, peacemaking tries to build bridges to people. It does not want the animosity to remain. It wants reconciliation. It wants harmony. You see, the idea here is that you can't sit by and watch two people at odds. You can't sit by and watch two people who are fighting. You can't. You want harmony. You want reconciliation. Peacemakers. Bridge builders. We need more of them. You know, I'm so tired of seeing fractured relationships. Just, we don't have to look very far. We know people. You know, one of my, my nieces, you know, I guess one of her close friend's parents are in the process of getting a divorce. So we see fragmented relationships, broken relationships. How that affects her friend, and she's witnessing this. We see broken relationships all around us. People who don't speak because of conflict. We need bridge builders. We need peacemakers. Bridge builders that will go and help make peace between God and this broken world. As we looked at last week, one of the Beatitudes. Who's going to make peace between God and this broken world? We need people who make, who will be bridge builders, peacemakers between people who are in conflict. I don't know anyone that has a great relationship with everybody. There's always that one relationship. Sometimes it's the close people that is closest to you. Sometimes it's fa- family. Sometimes it's the coworker, a classmate. We need bridge builders. Blessed are the bridge builders. The last beatitude, the eighth one, is found in verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What a way to finish the beatitudes, right? He writes all of these things and he says in verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness how do we how are we to understand this blessed are those who suffer for Christ blessed are those who suffer for Christ remember the word bless is not just happiness but it's this deep sense of joy so when you understand that have this sense of joy and suffering it, it, it's one of those oxymorons it just doesn't go well together at least in the world, it doesn't go together. But in, in God's mind, joy and suffering go hand in hand. That, that's the irony. Jesus asked a little bit more in verse 11. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Wow. Wow. Ble- okay, once again, blessed are you when these things are happening. I'm not sure how many of you would be joyful at, at the thought of being persecuted. To be joyful, to receive it with joy, to, or being ins- insulted, or having false accusations brought against us. Who enjoys that? If someone falsely accused me, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to hire the best lawyer. I'm going to do everything in my p- 
powers. Why? Because I have to make this right. I have to demonstrate or prove my innocence. Because my name means something. None of us will stand by. We will defend ourselves. False accusations. If I am insulted, how would I, how would I respond? Would I rejoice or be glad? Now, when it comes to things of um, just somebody insulting me by the way I look, whatever, that's fine. We should deal with that. But Jesus says, blessed are you when people do these things. Why? Because of me. So as Christians, if we're insulted, if we are, if false accusations are leveled against us, Jesus says, you're blessed. Rejoice and be glad, he says in verse 12. Rejoice and be glad. Rejoice and be glad, verse 12, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In the same way they persecuted the prophets before you. In this verse, he, he's, he's kind of talking about, look, all of these things, all of these beatitudes, the culmination is that when you are, ha- when you have these in your life, when you are walking with God, when you are, are really doing and growing and, and, and really doing the things that I want you to do, verse 10 is going to happen. Because as it says in verse 12, they have done it to the prophets before you. What makes you think they're going to stop now? Persecution will come. When it does, rejoice and be glad. As followers of Christ, we must be prepared. Prepared to suffer for Christ's sake. Could it be one of the reasons we don't suffer for Christ's sake is because people can't tell that we are Christians? Could it be one of the reasons why we don't struggle? America is such a, you know, for the most part, a just easygoing place. Nobody out there cares about the suffering of Christians. There are very few out there. But they care about all these other groups of people. And they're out there protecting their rights. But not our rights. So in that sense, I guess, generally, just the group that you belong, who you identify with already has brought on suffering. You know, as my son enters the public school system, I just worry so much. And he even said, you know, uh, somebody asked him, oh, how was school? He's like, oh, it's good, but it's not Christian. I'm like, what? Where, where does he get this idea? Does that mean he's already seeing difference? There's no worship. There is no uh, you know, praying. He, he doesn't see that happening. Teachers are not encouraging those things. It's just purely just academic. Is he already noticing a difference between his preschool, which was at a church, versus the public school? You know, on this journey of maturing in Christ, we have to live in a way that honors God. We have to live in a way that says, hey, you know what? I, my lifestyle, my life, my words, my actions are in contrast to those who that do not know Jesus. There has to be a distinction. And the Beatitudes gives us a, uh, some, a list of things, a way for us to live that should set us apart. But if we do that, if we follow these things, if we have it in our lives, verse 10, unfortunately, is what we have to prepare for. is the persecution 
the suffering. You know, I ask you to take inventory of your personal life in the last couple of weeks as we went through the Beatitudes. And I'm sure there are some of these areas that we are doing well in. But there's probably a few areas that you can improve upon. The journey of becoming mature in Christ or a disciple of Jesus, in essence, if we can break it down, is to have small victories each day. Sometimes we stand in, at this base of this mountain, which is the Beatitudes, and we say, how am I ever going to get to the top of this? Nobody climbs a mountain by sitting there thinking, how do I climb this mountain? What do you do? You take that first step, right? Imagine yourself at a, at a wall, a rock climbing wall. How do you get to the top? Well, you have to put your hands, your fingers, your toes onto the little pieces of rock, and you start making your way up. You could slip, you could fall. What do you do? You get back up. Let me encourage you this morning. That is the small steps, small victories each day that will enable us to mature in Christ. We grow little by little. One day you will look back and you'll be surprised how far you have grown. You may not even notice it. But if we're actively pursuing, actively seeking maturity in Christ, to at least go back to the Beatitudes here, to be peacemakers, to be bridge builders, the merciful, the meek, whatever. Small victories each day so that we are moving towards maturity in Christ. That is our goal.